And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of, spa of Space Aces, both the original, sh both the original sheets and the upcoming the new guidebook the one and only porthos how are you doing today man or tonight i'm doing, I'm doing pretty good how are you mildred i'm doing good um i am in my natural habitat which is real really friggin cold you're up in minnesota it's icy up there right yeah i have to i have to deal with the only downside is when is when walking up is when walking around, especially when walking to up and down the driveway. I have to walk very carefully because right now I have to deal with my worst combination. That is soft ice on top of so, soft snow on top of ice. That gets really dangerous. I, mm -hmm. I've seen what happens in Minnesota in the winter time on those sidewalks, and yeah, you can slip right into the road and end up in the next block. Yeah, I um fun watching him drive oh oh i've seen i've um i used to i used to work in an insurance agency so i've seen my fair share of stories <laughs> <laughs> i can imagine and when it comes when it comes to be and what makes it worse for me is that my driveway is on a um incline that's so, the worst yeah so 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 this time so this time of the year, whenever whenever it comes time to take out to take out the trash, instead of instead of wheeling the thing up and down, I just pick the whole thing up and carry it. <laughs> Did you see the video of the UPS guy delivering a package? I think it was in Minnesota, on an icy driveway. He couldn't get up it, so he had to like <laughs> balance on the the side of his truck and push himself off the truck and slide the package across the driveway to the guy. <laughs> I ha I have not seen that, but I feel like I should. It was very ingenious. It showed a lot of effort and made you really appreciate the company. Look, modern problems <laughs> require modern solutions. That's right. So, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Yeah, I mean, I'm a relative newcomer. I, a lot of these guys in the industry have been you know, playing for 40, 50 years. Um, I've only been playing these games for a couple of years myself. As a as a young lad, I used to play a lot on the uh, those play by post boards where you'd, you'd kind of write a story together with a bunch of other people and collaboratively. So I guess it's diceless role playing. And that's kind of where I got my first start uh, creating stories together with friends. Um, from there, I I got into game design quite a bit. Like design some some board games here and there. Got a iPhone game that's no longer in existence, but yeah, that's how it started off for me. Mm -hmm. And then during COVID and this pandemic and everything, I started getting really more back into like, hey, what's this whole role playing thing? I should get back to it and started uh, getting more into the games. And I will now I will admit when I saw when I saw the full name for space for space aces. Um, I meet. I immediately. I immediately had a bit of a laugh in a, you're not fooling anyone, man. Kind kind of way. Like with How like so? with the with the with the acronyms for the for the or the original sheets and the and the new the um and the new guidebook. I don't get it. <laughs> what do you mean? T O S T N G. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> ah. <laughs> Is that taken? No, it's it's not ta it's not oh. taken. The acronyms, <laughs> the, acro the acronym is one gi is very much one giant um, one. I looked at it as one giant nod to how people acronym um, different series for Star Trek. No idea. No, actually, that's probably one of my <laughs> proudest shower thoughts. Uh, yeah, I was I, I came out of the shower just like Eureka. And I hope, to, I hope to God you didn't pull an Archimedes doing that. <laughs> I just might have. <laughs> just saying. I'm just saying. Isn't it a little? Isn't it a little bit too cold? Isn't it a little bit too cold and damp to do that kind of thing? 
you get used to it. I think you'd understand. You get used to it. On one hand, yeah. On one hand, yes. On the other hand, um, well, you know the you know the story with Archimedes, right? What he did immediately after he disco after he discovered the thing in the bathtub. Actually, I don't know what he did after the bathtub. He, he ran bathtub. he ran down the he ran down the streets yelling Eureka Eureka, but he was so excited he forgot to put his robe back on. Oh well, in that case, absolutely. <laughs> so, give that uh, that the fact that you um had a very recent introduction to the hobby, and for for the record, um, everybody's got to start somewhere, and it is interesting that you that. You uh, kind of worked this in a weird way in reverse, since a lot of people will start with tabletop and then ve and then venture into video, whereas in your case it was the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. um, but were you? Did you grow up on on um, star on Star Trek like a lot of like a lot of folk? Yeah, I Star Trek, Stargate, mm -hmm. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Happy Sci-Fi. I grew up during the Golden Age, you know, on that. Yeah early, late 80s, early 90s, uh, Babylon 5, all those stuff. Mm -hmm. At one point in my life, there was, you know, three different series of Star Trek on at the same time. And yeah, and, D and DS9 was the best of them. I would agree. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's like comparing children. How do, you, how do you compare which one you love the most, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't have kids, but what is it? Yeah, I've... Um... I will I will I will admit I will admit that um the fir if I need a if I need a punching bag and just look I can just look at the first two seasons of um TNG. <laughs> it took a while to they all take a while to kind of they say grow the beard, right? And uh, yeah, the first two seasons of TNG are pretty good. I like how Worf's head gets smaller every every season. The uh, well, a lot of that is the f a lot of that is the fact that um ro that Roddenberry I've I've often argued that Roddenberry I'm not entirely sure if he fully understood what made his show work. Hmm. Given how given how um when TNG started, he had the mindset of I'm gonna show people I'm gonna show people what it was actually supposed to be like. Is he was he was basically he was not happy with the with the quote unquote militarization of the movies, which is kind of silly if you ask me. I mean, if you've got you've got naval ranks and a naval hierarchy, and you're on a ship with weapons, you have orders, and if you don't follow those orders, you can be court-martialed. How is that not a military? <laughs> right. It's it's a yeah. I never quite understood how to put those two together. But the problem is he. Had, the problem is it was a case of paradise protest too much when it came to how he wanted to depict his utopia. Mm -hmm. Um. But when now when it came to when it came to space aces, um. When you were designing, when you finally sat down to design to design the thing, was one of your goals, um, a level of simplicity and. With if so, if so, were there any were there any um, RPGs that you specifically took inspiration from with how you designed its sandbox? Yeah, I mean, since I was relatively new to the hobby, I was looking mm -hmm. at a lot of different games, a lot of different systems, and trying to figure out what what would be fun to run and what would be fun to play with my friends and to teach them and and to teach my wife so she'd play with me, and uh, that immediately ruled out most of the games out there because they're you know you get these tomes of 300 pages and systems and this and that so, and i wanted something that was easy and flowy and light and, and fun so i was immediately attracted to like uh, grant howitt's games john harper's games uh, those one page rpgs there's a then i found iron sworn mm -hmm. and started to realize hey i could play with myself and, and fully enjoy these systems but again, even then, it still had a lot of rules, and there was a lot of system to it, which is good, and it helps to run things, but I wanted to see how how much I could take out, how much you could reduce a game down to. So I'm like, hey, if I can fit a game on a business card, I think I may have a solid system, because then I can teach somebody very quickly. We can play on the go anywhere. So that was my first challenge, is to, to look at these systems and how can I boil them down to something that I could fit on a business card with mm -hmm. readable type. And that's what started the the original sheets. Mm -hmm. 
that was the that was the initial challenge I set for myself. Yep. And I know you mentioned I know you mentioned I you mentioned um Iron Sworn and obviously um Iron Sworn is a is a heavily modified but still based on a heavily modified version of but still based on powered by the apocalypse. Were there any other um PBTA um games that you had dip, that you had dipped into before before diving into creating space aces or was that the main one? Iron Sworn has a spot near and dear to my heart. I, I thoroughly that taught me a lot about what what a game could be, how you could take a game that works GM'd and then co-op and then solo and put it all together. So it, it could all work in all three different settings. I very much like Monster of the Week as well. I mean, those... It, and I actually drew a lot of inspiration from my tables from Monster of the Week and how they give you a, just a, a simple word and then also, you know, like a you, you get the setting and then you get the description of the setting in a, in a parenthesis and it's one word and it keeps it very simple but very evocative. Mm-hmm. And actually, in the I, I it was the the Star Runes and Space Hulks module of the game. I used a PBTA move that I kind of hacked, and uh, I forget which game it was from, but it was for dungeon diving. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very elegant and very beautiful, and uh, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed those. Yeah, the whole style. Now, even with even with that, you're you're going with a um, D twenty and D six ro- rolling system. With the mm-hmm. D twenty being the um, being the difficulty, and that's cer- that's certainly a venture away from the PBTA approach, where a lot where a lot of times the um, difficulty level is fairly set. Um, you're ju- it's just a, it's just a modifier to the uh, dice roll. Mm-hmm. What pr- what prompted the idea of do- of using D twenty four difficulty in the way that you did? I really like D20s. I like to look at them. I like how they roll. Um, I like the swinginess of the, the gameplay that they bring because it, it's very theatrical, right? With huge successes or huge losses, you get critical successes. Um, I also like the way 2D6 sound when you when they go clickety-clack and you roll them, right? So I'm like, you know, I want... I wanted to have a D6 in there too, also. Yep. Uh, I, I don't like the... 2d6 is great and it's amazing and, and you cannot knock that system with the bell curve and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted something that was swingy and, and you know s- swing for the benches and try stuff out. So I'm get- you wanted to add a bit of um, ca- a bit of chaos to the setup. Yeah, yeah. Rather than con- continually going towards the middle, I, I I thoroughly enjoy the chaos and the fun and the laughs and mm-hmm. stuff that come results from that. Now. Obvious now something something else I um I had no I had noticed is there se- there um there seems to be the implica- the implication that space aces could be used for solo play as well as as well as using the traditional table and table and GM approach. Um, mm-hmm. was that something that you ha- was that something that you had designed explicitly for, or was it something that kind of fell into place as you were developing the game. Well, Space Aces started off as trying to boil Iron Sworn down to something I could play with my wife. Mm-hmm. And that she wouldn't get mad at me when random things happened and I had a good excuse. Um, so what... It, it was kind of built in. And Iron Sworn, the, the solo play is kind of built into it as well. And I just kind of the whole time was like, listen, if this is going to happen... I want a table to give me a result for for, for what's going to happen, and that that just naturally lends itself towards solo play. Yeah, because if you're a, a hapless GM like me, or you you're always looking for inspiration, or you need you need help, that's essentially what solo play is there for. It's to give you ideas. And so the two go hand in hand real well, I mm-hmm. think. And that brings me to another thing. Um, within the within the book, it's described it's it's described as tools over rules. Now I can I can infer a few guesses as to as to what that what that means as far as the philosophy you have with it, but could you elaborate on that on that particular mantra? Yeah, there's a movement called the FKR movement, the Free Kriegspiel Revolution, where I think that's how they pronounce it, right? I actually haven't said it out loud before, uh, where they're they're trying to 
take the system out of a game and just make it the referee does it all um, and it, it stays very simple and you adapt the game to the people as you go. You don't need a, a rule, you don't need a, an entire system for every single possible thing that will happen or a modifier for if you're under a bush or if you're above them or below them because uh, you naturally know those things already mm-hmm. and when you codify it and when you when you start adding it in it just bulks up a whole bunch of knowledge that you have to have and it makes the rule books get huge and confusing so i tried to take all of that out and make it as simple as possible so that you have tools on hand if you need them or if you want them but as few rules as you as, as possible you say do you really need that rule mm-hmm. and what if i took that rule out could the game still work and if it worked i took the rule out and got rid of it yeah that makes that makes sense and i'm and I'm guessing that within that you you still want to have the mindset of all ro- all roads lead to the D6 and D20. Yeah, trying to have a very solid core. Uh, just a... Um the reason I bring that up is e- even with a lot of um old a lot of old school and OSR games they s- some of them do fall into the trap of having ex- of having exceptions to their core. You know, where sometimes you need to roll high and sometimes you need to, you need to roll low. Yeah, that, that confuses me. I'm a simple man. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so I I tried to stay very simple to that. That constant rolling higher is better. Mm-hmm. Rolling lower is worse. Yeah. Um. Now, when it comes now. In some in some of the in some of the early play, given the in, given the um, origins. Of space aces, were th- were there ever were there ever points in time where you had considered um, do where you considered doing um, playbooks, or was that something that you had that you n- had no intention of going with? Yeah, outer world or uh, off worlders does playbooks with their games, and mm-hmm. no, I, I never really had an intention of doing playbooks. I I want to. F- to have players to have the freedom to do whatever they want, um, yep. as they like it, and to use their own their own creativity rather than the, a set of of moves that they have available to them. Speaking of that freedom, would you would you say that um, that Space Aces is at its most comfortable in episodic play? Yes, absolutely. And obviously, that I'm not trying to imply that it can't be used for a lo- for a multi part long form campaign. It's just it's just um not it's just not where it's gonna, not where it's going to be and it's most um comfortable yeah very similar to lasers and feelings i mean you you can extend it if you want but it mm-hmm. it's it's at its most fun when it's a single episode or a couple episodes put together yeah. um just like star trek it's at its best when it's one or two episodes put together rather than mm-hmm. a gigantic season of a uh, nonsense now me personally i um I like to take I like to take a tiers and tent poles approach. How's that? Um, now tier tiers and tent poles is I will admit is not a term that I came up with. It was a term that Greg Weiss um, coined to describe the episode flow for um, gargoyles, which I liked as a kid. It basically there are there are certain there were certain episodes that could be put in any order, but only between specific milestone episodes. Mm-hmm. So you'd have you'd have the you'd have these sets of episodes that could be oh, that could be placed in any order between certain episodes that adv- that specifically advance the story. You know, kind of eb- kind of ebb and flow approach. I think I think it's a nice compromise between full campaign and um, episodic. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, and that's kind of naturally in my play tests with friends and family. With this, this is what happens because as you're playing, you the universe changes mm-hmm. you, you start because there's not really a setting it's kind of an implied you're in outer space and there's a lot of crazy things happening but that's about it yeah. so you're filling the universe out and as you do that you naturally start to use more of the pieces that you you invent as you go mm-hmm. that's a really good way of putting it out i like that yeah and speaking of play testing now a lot of times when 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 a game go, when a game goes out into the wild even in a limited sense like in like in playtesting with friends or family, there's oh, there's often there's often something that comes up that what that uh, wasn't exactly accounted for at the start, 
Did you have any instance like that early on? Let me think. Because the beauty of putting it on a business card is mm -hmm. you use the excuse, I'm purposefully not accounting for everything, right? Because mm -hmm. I can only put it on a business card, and therefore any rules that I didn't account for, fill them in and make them as house rules as you go. And that's kind of how I've also even done the, the new guidebook. Also, that rules can't cover. I, I don't want rules for every single possible thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jake... Role players that had been in the industry and been playing games for a lot longer than me, mm -hmm. uh, they were able to help me avoid some of the pitfalls area. Yep. Um. And when now, one thing that one thing that I did find a bit I did find a bit amusing simply because when it comes to this particular style of space opera, it's not tackled as much. Is putting it is putting in things like space ruins and Max. Now, obviously, when I saw the name Star Hulk, I immediately thought of um, the Space Hulks in Warhammer Forty Thousand. But mm -hmm. but a lot of a lot of times when somebody does this sort of space opera, they don't tend to put in Mecha. Um, <laughs> was that was that one was that one of those things that just get that just got added on with um, time? Yeah, I started to play with some friends, and they're like, "Man, I really wish you could play with some mechs." I'm like, oh, I can do that. Let's let's put let's put some mechs and kaiju in there. And they're like, oh, we really like Pokemon. I'm like, you know what? Let's do that too. So with my group, it was as things came up. I started to make rules and systems. Mm -hmm. Some of them stuck and made it into the game. Other ones we just kind of tossed out. But those ones stuck around because I mean, what's what's more fun than playing a mech and fighting a giant kaiju? Were there were there any that were there any that um you really liked the idea of, but you but couldn't get but it but. When it came to trying to put pen to paper, it just didn't um, pan out. I don't view them as not panned out yet. I just view them as I haven't figured them out. I have a lot of ideas. I'm I, I, I'm already planning on a doing a Space Aces supplemental mm -hmm. uh, sequel where I can stick all these other ideas in there. Um, are you are you gonna if you do that supplement are you gonna keep are you gonna keep up the acronym gag or is that or is that only get is that was only gonna be a two off? Well, Space Ace is supplemental is like Captain's Log supplemental. Mm -hmm. If I can figure out a better one, I will definitely be keeping up the acronym gag. Yeah. Um, I just haven't taken a long enough shower yet to get to that solution. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think if you have to take a shower that long, by the time you'd be out of it, you'd turn into a prune. Yeah, very likely. So it's, it's a series of small showers over time to get the full idea. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of things I wanted to do. I just I didn't they didn't make sense to fit them into the guidebook, and I couldn't fit them on a business card. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on a I'm setting right now 64 million ways to wake up from stasis, which is the trouble of stasis pods. Mm -hmm. I've got that mostly filled out at this point. So just the settings and things that you can slide in there to help you out with how to start the game and where to go. So there'll be a lot of additions to it and little mini games throughout it, all of it. The goal being kind of like a Mario Party of RPGs. Just a lot of fun, simple, easy mini games. Mario uh, Party, but without the torture. Exactly, without the torture. It makes perfect sense. Let's, let's be honest, Mar Mario Party is the other game that ends friendships. <laughs> and the only reason I say that kind of thing is, beca is because... As an April Fool's gag, I gave I um, gave a buddy of mine a plush um, blue shell just to haunt him. I think many a friendship has broken up over Mario Party. <laughs> um, well, that and it's the only Nintendo game that that got that got Nintendo into legit legal trouble. Did it really? Yeah, the um, the. The uh, mini, the uh, some of the mini games in the original um, c had prob related caused some problems. Namely, those uh, mini games were, were were it was about rotating the rotating the um, control stick as fast as you can. 
Because it would break the controller? It wouldn't break the controller, but you're, but a lot of people, instead of using their thumb or their or their index finger, they'll use their palm and start, and start rubbing in circles, and that caused indents um, to the point where Nintendo was forced to issue gloves. <laughs> Couldn't use those because the controllers would get so sharp when you take a little rubber off the, the joystick. <laughs> yeah. I'm cutting my fingers. Yeah. And... Unsurprisingly, they haven't really done that um, that particular style of mini game all that often since. Oh. but when it comes when see why. now when it comes to one of the, when when it comes to the sector mapper, um, that w- was now obviously I had seen the I had first seen the sector mapper in action when um. When J- when Jacob Ross did a stream on it, um, mm-hmm. but was that was that something that you had, that you had been using extensively um, during pl- during playtests to kind of bu- to kind of build a world instead of so you didn't have to just use the same old sandbox? No, that's relatively new. That wasn't in the original sheets because uh, there's no way I could fit that on the business card. So I did, was always in the back of my mind as something I wanted to create a your own sandbox as you go. I uh, looked at a lot of different ways that games have approached to that. Mm-hmm. And there's some pretty cool ones out there, but I tried to go with something incredibly simple, as, as simple as I could get it. Although what I do no- what I do notice is a lot of the generators that you have they're mostly one p- the rule set is mostly one page. Yeah. Was was that intentional the, the idea of I need to fit all the I need to fit all the rules for this particular mechanic onto one page. Yeah. I'm still keeping with that goal as much as mm-hmm. possible uh, between one or like one full page on, on one side. Yeah. And, if, and for me personally, I appreciate the, the, em- the emphasis on e- on so many of them relying on random generators because we here in the temple love using those to create the dumbest shit that we can. <laughs> <laughs> so do I very much so. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's a cheat it's a cheat way of getting a lot more content into a game without having to use a lot of space and actually figure that content out. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a nice trick. And given the um given this given the setup within within it, I'm I get the feeling that even even though you're going for optimistic SF that um that you want that you intend for Space Aces to be kind of a a more open sandbox to do uh, to do um to do different levels of of science fiction instead of instead of just purely doing um Star Trek, which is what I could see as an easy assumption. Yeah, since there's no uh, setting in there, as much as as little as possible, at least uh, it it could run many different settings or anything mm-hmm. you'd want. I just wanted to stay towards happy things for myself, and yeah. if someone wants to run a mothership style or or something more. Expansy and, and and dark, uh, it it's, would completely handle that. Although, Probably a few jokes, more jokes here and there than they'd expect. But between you and me, I'm be, I'd be more inclined to run something akin to akin to a akin to um, Firefly with a little bit more crazy. And that would absolutely very <laughs> easily work in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's basically built for that. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to go hard scrabble, real rough stuff because I mean, Sean Tompkin is doing. Iron Sword and Star Forged, and, mm-hmm. and I don't know if you've been able to take a look at that at all, but that is hands down going to elevate the whole genre. So I wasn't even going to touch that theme or that that style. I stuck with what I knew best, and that's that's happy, hopeful sci-fi. The way the way I see it, um, he's he's trying to ma- he's trying to make a um, he's trying to make a five a five course me a three course meal. You're trying to make a burger and a beer. Yeah, very much so. Neither one's better than the other, but both need to be around. Sometimes you need a burger. Sometimes you need the three to five course meal. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And there's a and of course of that's all and hell there's that's the reason why the phrase beer and pretzels has been part of the RPG lexicon for years. And I just learned that recently. I'm like, hey, that's the that's what Space Aces is. It's a beer and pretzels RPG. Mm-hmm. And I'd say I'd say the 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 um, closest contemporary to the, to this sort of beer and pretzels approach 
which which is a which I haven't seen in a, which people haven't seen in a while is stu- is stuff like Star Frontiers from way back in the um, TSR days. Hmm. Um, that was one. Yeah, that was one Star of their. Frontiers. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, it, it's very. It, I enjoyed Star Frontiers, and I, I I found a couple other hard to find esoteric ones like like Tales from the Floating Vagabond. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an an old Star Trek RPG that was made. Um, I don't think it was ever published, but I I got to see that, and I was like, yeah, these are very much in that same vein. But there's not a lot of happy, humorous sci-fi. RPGs out there. The only big, the only big one I can think of is um, co- is Cosmic Patrol. Oh, okay. In the, but um, Cosmic Patrol is lean is leaning a, is leaning a little is leaning more specifically into the direction of straight up pulp SF, whereas what you're doing is it can certainly be pulp SF, but it's not explicitly aiming for that. Yeah, I would agree with that. And of course, when I when I refer to pulp SF, I'm talking about say Flash Gordon or um, Buck Rogers. Yeah. Um, both both entries being th- being things that I'm probably way too young to know about. <laughs> that's, that, that's I wasn't gonna say. I was saying I, I've honestly never seen Flash Gordon for Buck Rogers, so I, um, it was well before my time. <laughs> Well, I've, I saw the movie in the '80s, and I knew and I knew about the co- the comic strip. Um, Buck Rogers, I only knew about through the co- through the comic strip and the um, RPG adaptation that had a bit of a story to it. Um, but when, but um, now you have now um, now when it came to when. It, when it came to some, when it came to some of the um, some of these setups, especially with the with the whole mech thing, this is something that I wanted to touch on for a bit. Um, mm-hmm. When you, when you were asked about mechs, were there was was there a specific style of of mech that was suggested to you? Because the idea of the mech comes can come in two kinds of flavors. The Spiky and the Stompy. The Stompy, of course, being the more tank-like mech, tank-like mechs, the kinds you'd see in, say, uh, Mech Warrior, a, a bit of Armored Core, that kind of thing. Whereas mm-hmm. the Spiky ones are the ones that are more power armor-like, the gu- your um your Gundams and stuff like that. Yeah. Um. No, it wasn't really mentioned as far as what they preferred. I. I... Probably should have asked them at the mm-hmm. time. I just kind of uh, assumed they were looking for something like a big cartoon anime mech. Which uh, is definitely something I can is definitely something I can see. Um, the main re- the main reason I asked is is simply is simply the fact that mech um, even in even in anime can take can take many forms. Um, something like Votoms is far removed from something like Robotech. Mm-hmm. For sure. And there's very little guidance, even on that one half page, right, of what a mech is and what exactly it does or how big it happens to be. So it's open enough to be interpreted, mm-hmm. hopefully, however you like into your game. Yeah. Um, there is the rule because everybody loves Voltron and Power Rangers. So there is the, the additional rule so you, you can combine your mechs into one. Because mm-hmm. what's cooler than doing that in, in a clutch moment, right? Well, as long as you're as long as you're using the proper lion-based Voltron and not the lame vehicle one. I don't. I don't even recognize that as Voltron. Good. Nobody. Do, nobody does because it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> but when it came, um. But when it comes to the when it comes to the um. The set the setup that you ha- that you have one of the other mechanics that I was curious about its particular inception, maybe and maybe this is maybe this was something that was born from Iron Sworn or so- or something else is the concept of heat level. Mm-hmm. Huh? the the just the idea of it being used as a potential clock or 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 some some similar expanding scenario. How did how did heat level come about? That was there from the very start. 
high. Because with the complication mechanic where you can roll and you get a complication, I wanted some way of determining how serious that would be. Um, because otherwise it's arbitrarily up to the GM to figure out in the moment how serious an, a complication could be for the people. And, uh, and they'll start to complain, oh, that's too serious, that's not too serious. But this way now you've got a clock mm -hmm. that literally says, hey, you're at heat level one, you're going to stub your toe, but you get to heat level 20, you're going to lose your toe. It just makes, you, you can point to it and say, no, no, that's the heat level. That's the ex excuse for that. So it was kind of there from the very inception. Mm -hmm. And then working it into different ways and different uh, parts of the game, like using it as a clock, you can roll your D20 and, and find out when a snag might hit secretly to yourself. It was just continuing to, to build on that mechanic throughout the game. Yep. And when it come now when it came to the when it came to the whole the whole concept of um st of stakes um was that was that mainly as a was that mainly designed as a narrative assist yeah i very much enjoyed is it blades in the dark Scum and Villainy, both of those two, right, that, that has you set the mm -hmm. stakes for a situation. Mm -hmm. I really like the clarity that that provides for your playing characters and things. And it also takes some of the stress off of the GM, because you ask your players right away, and I really enjoyed that. Hey, what's going to happen if you fail? And often they're like, oh, I'm probably going to get shot. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, now you're not going to be mad at me when I have you get shot when you fail. And So when you let your players set the stakes mm -hmm. and have a little quick conversation it makes it so much smoother yeah now at pr at the t at the time at the time of this um setup um even though there's nine there's nine days to go on the new guidebook um do you consider do you consider the new guidebook to be kind of a director's cut of the original sheets I would say it's, it's 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 literally the next generation, because um, there's a lot more to it, and mm -hmm. I've taken a number of the systems and and tweaked and changed and even further simplified or further streamlined a lot of what's on those business cards to be better, in my opinion. The whole the whole dungeon diving the rules have changed completely, uh, and a number of other rules have have been. Streamlined quite a bit, I think. So I'd, I'd call it the, the next iteration altogether. Mm -hmm. Now, like now, I do want to I do want to give my congrats for the, for getting well over your um your initial your initial goal since you were asking for fourteen hundred and you're at the time of this recording at six thousand and change. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as as far as a release window for the PDF version, at least, of the new guidebook? It is done. Problem is, I'm daily finding spelling errors. So, <laughs> it's, 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 it's done, dot, dot, dot. I'm going to release it to all the backers as a beta test and then get their feedback. Um, probably in a month or two, I'll have it completely out and, and released to everybody. All right, that... Def that definitely makes sen that definitely makes sense. Um, and I'm get I'm guessing the pr I'm guessing the printed version will be um, pro probably um, spring spring sum spring summerish in that area. Yeah, I'm not sure what the shipping times are with Mixum, um, but as soon as I can release it on mm -hmm. PDF, is when I'm confident enough to say, hey, I'm ready to go to print as well. Yep. And then there'll be another month while they print it up and send it to me. So uh, yeah, I would assume what's it, January? Mm-hmm. May. Yeah, springtime. Late spring. Yep. And give now um un now I didn't I didn't see much in the way of stretch goals, so I'm ass I'm assuming that the um that it's gonna that it's going to stay at about twenty four pages. Um the way the as as written on the um, Kickstarter page, yeah, it's it's pretty tight and and compact and complete in itself. Mm -hmm. To expand it further, I think would get a little bit overwhelming. And also, I I don't understand stretch goals on Kickstarter or why why not just give everybody the full thing and then raise that amount of money that you need for it. It, it so it was just a gimmick I didn't quite figure out. 
Well, I think in, I think in your case there, there there would be the obvious question of well how how could I even expand it? <laughs> that that was the other thing. Um, I, to add anything else to it seemed pointless. I just give everybody everything I can fit in there into one nice compact system. Mm -hmm. But I I can definitely say that I'll be looking forward to how, how it's to um how it's going to shake out, and I can. Well, certainly say I will pro that I will probably in the coming weeks I will probably be dedicating some time to messing around with the uh, generators that that it has because whenever whenever my group gets together to, to use any sort of character any sort of random character world or what have you generator the greatest and worst things end up coming out of that. <laughs> Like we did, we did that with creating random mechs a few weeks ago, and we ended up with some of the most unholiest of OP abominations. And that's just fun, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's great. It, <laughs> work with the randomness. Uh, of course, I've worked hard to make sure that, as much as possible, it works well together with the tables, and mm -hmm. that's a lot of fun to do. Oh yeah. Uh, but the thing I just finished, uh, which I'm, I didn't know if I would be able to fig get it locked down, is is the life path generator. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if your version has that or not. But uh, no, I didn't see that. Okay, I'll I'll have to send you the updated version. But I just got that locked down, and I'm like, this this completes the whole package because now you can generate a character with a whole backstory like Traveler, and you, and I really wanted a rule. It, it's possible to die in character generation. <laughs> I just it tickles me, and I love it, and it, it's wonderful. Uh, and if you don't like the character. Then it's it's an NPC, and if it dies, he's a legend or a rumor that somebody else hears about, right? Mm -hmm. But I was able to like generate a what was it? It was, it was it, a kid detective that grew up on a cowboy space station who got a limp and now solves crime with his uh, bedazzled, aggressive hermit crab friend and a irritable space cowboy childhood friend. And if that's not a great story, and you can't just see ways to go with that, then. I can see many them. ways to go with that, and they're all <laughs> gloriously horrible. Right. <laughs> but with all, with all that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. Oh, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. I appreciate you finding me and, and asking me on here. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here... Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you very much. Space Aces goes best with a drink or five. Well, we did say it's a beer and pretzels game. You got it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>